Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Welcome to the series Muslim Relations with Christians, Jews and Others. I am your host Muhammad Nuruddin Lemu and with me to discuss today's topics are two of our distinguished uh, facilitators, trainers and scholars in this area, Brother Nasir Bello and Brother Ibrahim Bello. You are both most welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. The topic I'd like us to look at today is that of brotherhood of love um, and also we touch on a common verse that is sometimes uh, interpreted in different ways to imply we cannot be friends with people of other faiths so inshallah we'll be looking at that today i'd like to start with the question of words of affection uh, and my question will start with Mahalan ibrahim bello is it okay for us to love like genuinely not just I like uh, a person of another faith, but to be close enough to say you love them, um, you have deep um, affection towards them. Are these words or feelings legitimate from the Islamic point of view? Or is it, no, you can't have love for a non-Muslim, it's only a Muslim uh, you can love. I'll come back also to the question of, can I call somebody my Christian brother? Or, you know, I'll come back to that one. But let's just start with this deep level of liking, of affection, of love for another good human being, does the fact that they belong to another religion make it unacceptable in Islam for me to love them? Okay. Uh, naturally, love is usually as a result of your service to somebody. If you show concern and care towards somebody, naturally, is bound to love you mm. and in fact this is not just human beings even animals mm. and like the wise saying goes even though many will say it is not a hadith that uh, the mind the mind human mind is, is is tends towards loving the person that is kind to him so okay it's okay for somebody to love somebody irrespective of his religion usually you don't love somebody for no reason sake it's because of whether a mutual benefit or a service or the care and the concern and this is surprising that uh, people will be surprising to hear that that even Quran has it the Prophet ﷺ has a very caring uncle who was very concerned about his welfare right from childhood and at the time he was very concerned if this man should die not a Muslim and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded him in Quran chapter 28 verse 56 he said, Inna kala tahadi man ahababta. Walakin Allah yahadi man yasha. Walakin Allah yahadi man yasha. Verily, you cannot guide whom you love. It is Allah whom, who guides whom he likes. Referring to his uncle, mm -hmm. Abu Talib, who was not a Muslim. He didn't die as a Muslim. He was a polytheist, was, actually. Polytheist. Mm -hmm. And it will remain in record. Mm -hmm. But Allah used the word love between mm. him and the prophet so it is okay Hope. it is possible mm. maybe later we're also going to see when allah say a muslim man can marry a kitabia mm. a woman from the people of the book you don't marry somebody you don't love mm. so it is okay and it's very possible interesting yeah. maybe nasser if you could shed some more light on this issue well, of affection i think uh, another word that uh, you would find in the quran apart from hope is the word mawadda, mm. which is signifying the same thing, love, friendly relationship. And uh, there is a verse in the Quran where Allah said, perhaps Allah will create or please between you and your enemy that love. Allah is all powerful over everything. Allah is, uh, Allah, Allah is merciful and He is forgiving. Asallahu an yaja'ala baynakum wa baynahum mawaddata. Uh, so, so, so this actually is talking about that love mawadda that could be possible that, that, that can happen between people that were initially enemies mm. and if you look at history there are a lot of examples of that um, the second verse uh, is talking about the context of a husband and a wife where Allah said, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً and that Allah has instilled, has uh, made between the husband and wife that 
love, mawadda, and compassion. And if we remember, we discussed earlier about the verses that made it permissible for Muslims to marry those that are non-Muslims. Mm. And if the kind of relationship that is obtainable between spouses is that of mawadda and rahma, then uh, there is no boundary mm. regarding uh, that and even Quran acknowledge mm. the existence of this kind of you know, relationship. And I think, you know, just like all forms of love, um, so long as your loving for somebody does not conflict with your love for Allah, does not conflict with the, in other words, your love does not make you do something contrary, um, there's nothing wrong in love itself uh, or that deep affection, um, as you've already acknowledged, uh, between you and enemies, uh, within family, the Prophet and his uncle who was a polytheist. In other words, difference in religion is not a barrier to really deeply loving somebody. The most important thing is don't allow that love to make you disobey Allah. I'd like to, you know, prod a bit uh, deeper. Um, on various occasions, you would find in public spaces or sessions, um, a Muslim saying, you know, talking about his, um, his uh, fellow Christian brother or uh, his Christian sister and describing somebody of another faith as brother. Uh, or sister. And we have, I know within the Muslim community, those who feel, no, 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 no. Uh, Muslims are brothers of each other. The Uhuwa and brotherhood is within the faith. You can't call another person a brother or a sister. How would you respond to that? I think uh, we earlier talked about this hadith of Rasulullah that, that where, he, where he said, O mankind, your father is one and your God who created you is one. You are all from Adam and Adam was created. So that brotherhood of humanity uh, is important to always be remembered. And you would find a lot of verses in the Quran where Allah referred uh, prophets as going to, uh, as to the web, where Allah referred prophets that were sent to people as they, they are sent to their brothers. Another very interesting statement was attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib where he said, every person you see is of two kinds. He is either your brother in faith or your equal in humanity. So uh, by implication, your brother in humanity because you have, you know, the, the same root. And some of the examples of this place is where you would see Allah talking about sending uh, this prophet to his brothers. Uh, and when Allah was describing how category of people that, you know, uh, refuse to accept the message of their prophet, um, when he said, وَآدِن وَآدِن وَفِرْعَوْنَ وَإِخْوَانُ الْلُوتِ وَأَصْحَابُ الْأَخَتِ وَقَوْمُ الطُبَّةِ So these are some of, the, some of the names that were mentioned. So he said, وَإِخْوَانُ الْلُوتِ mm -hmm. And the brothers of Lut. The brothers of Lut are the people that Allah sent Lut to them. Mm -hmm. But Allah called them his brothers. And these are not, of course, Muslims. If you look at the story of what transpired between him and them. And this is not just one example. You find very many examples like I, 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 I cited with the Samud, with the Ad and, and, and what have you. So it is, it is, it is in the Quranic discourse. It's common in the Quranic discourse and the Quranic approach to refer to that you know, brotherhood of human in humanity, uh, and that is why even the messengers that are sent to their people, they are regarded or, or, or called the brothers to their brothers. That's interesting, Malam Ibrahim. What would you add? Yeah, just to build on that, Surah to Shu'ara, Quran chapter twenty-six, has a number of these terms. Allah told us about uh, story of more than six prophets, and in all instances, He will address Him. Relative to his people as a brother. Kazabat kaumu nuhin il mursalina. Is kala lahum akuhum. You know? That the people of Nuh denied their prophet. They belied him when they are brother. Mm. Of course, he's their brother. He's a blood brother. He was one of them. Mm. Even if they don't share faith, they share brotherhood of blood relation, brotherhood in humanity. Kinship. Kinship. Humanity, yeah. So Allah said the same thing regarding Nuh, Hudu, Shu'aib, Luth, a number of prophets. Mm. To show you that it is okay, it is normal, that even if they don't share faith, 
they share blood relation they share brotherhood in humanity and like the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would say kullukum li adam all of you are from adam so all of us are from adam so we are descendants of adam so we are brother in humanity not only that we are bani adama children of adam allah used this irrespective of your faith in more than five instances in quran ya bani adama ya bani adama so in essence we are brothers in faith or in humanity like sayyidina ali is reported to say so there is nothing wrong absolutely in calling brother sometimes you know there is a wisdom when you even say my brother it shows what you call ishfaq in arabic you no know, like care concern when you say my brother you know there are there are terms you use to show you care yes. concern and love which is okay even in dawa mm. irrespective guess, of somebody's yeah. faith i guess the way allah says ya ibadi alladhina asra ya ibadi thank you he calls them my servants exactly. even though he is describing our people who have gone beyond limits in committing exactly. sins exactly so this is it this is uh, in other words what we find is the word for or words for love um, such as hub uh, and mawadda are used in the quran by allah to describe relationships between muslims and people of other faiths and this is not something that is condemned it's actually looked upon as very normal um and of course expected even uh, when you look at the fact that a lot of muslims and non-muslims even belong to the same family some are uh, parents some are spouses uh, etc and then as you've mentioned the question of brotherhood now in light of the fact that you have verses of the quran that describe your relationship or the relationship between even prophets and their people and vice versa as one of brotherhoods of love of affection um some muslims would still say you cannot be friends with people of other faiths and they would bring verses of the quran like a common one in surah al-maida in chapter 5 verse 51 and say this verse is saying a uh, muslim should not take jews and christians as friends or as awliya and it's interpreted as friends um and from that the impression is given you can't be friends with non-muslims and yet at the same time we find other verses of the quran describing that you can even marry and you can be you know have that level of affection uh, described as mawadda and rahma and somebody can be your your brother how would you approach this verse is it being misinterpreted what's the what's going on with it it is true that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala address muslims in quran chapter 5 verse 51 يا ايها الذين امنوا لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى اولياء بعضهم اولياء بعض that oh you who believe do not take jew and the christians as your awliya protectors confidants okay they are awliya of one another but awliya in arabic is a broad term which could mean helpers supporters friends confidants okay but It's also good to understand Quran in a broader sense. Allah will not contradict himself. This is the same Quran that said there is nothing wrong in being nice and kind to any other person that is not hostile to you. Mm-hmm. So we understand that why this verse is actually cautioning Muslims not to but in what context? This to a particular context. Most of the verses particularly verses like this were tied to a particular context and you discover that nearly verses like this were revealed in Medina mm. that's when you have hypocrites you don't have hypocrites in Mecca nearly no mm. really but at a situation in the situation where you can have people who feel the only way to be relevant is to become a muslim then they can hide a different understanding even when they are not muslims mm. and come to say they are muslims So these people were wreaking havoc mm-hmm. to the Muslim community. And so they seek to please non-Muslims just to gain their support at the expense of uh Islam when the interest of Islam is at stake. So these were the people Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala addressed. Imam Qurtubi was categorical about this. That is when the interest of Islam is at stake, these people seek to help to please 
to gain support of these people. Even if they have to commit sin, they have to commit crime, they have to leak the secret of Muslims, particularly in hostile periods, during the battle of Uhud, during the battle of, you know, all those instances like that. Typically, there were a group of Muslims, those who claim to be Muslims actually, from among the followers of the Prophet, who go to, you know, to, to, to like align with the Jew who betrayed the treaties they had with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they were doing you know that kind of double standard baina baina so they are the people that most of these verses were addressing and of course lesson for other Muslims to not to do that when the interest of their faith is at stake but the issue of friendship is broad you can be friends at work you can be friends in school you can be friends because of you share some things in common, but not at the detriment or compromising any value of your religion. Okay? So, if somebody will be a friend to somebody, even at the expense of compromising the value of his religion, then this is where this verse comes into play. But aside that, there's nothing stopping good interaction, friendliness to people of other faiths. So what you're saying is scholars like Qurtubi, uh, Ibn Kathir, actually make it clear that this verse is specifically about Muslims who are hypocrites, yes. Muslims who, it's not just the uh, allies with others, but allies in undermining Muslims. So it's not just Muslims and non-Muslims coming together to do something, uh, not just any kind of allegiance. It is allegiance to undermine the Muslim community that this verse is specifically about. No. Uh, and I think uh, an example is that of Abu Lula, um, who was known to be a hypocrite, but somebody who... Um, on one side says he's a Muslim, but on another side is actually busy undermining the Muslim Ummah with others. Yeah. Alam Nasser, what would you add to this? Well, I think uh, it's important to always look at the context of the verse. If you look at what Imam Musa'adi said about the context of the revelation of the verse, he said it is related to the incident in, Ho in the Battle of Uhud, when things become so tough, uh, so much so that some companions become afraid uh, and scared to a level that they took Jews and Christians around as confident because of the way they become scared. Other scholars uh, argued that it's actually specifically rebuilt on Abdullah ibn uh, Ubay ibn Salul, uh, who the verse is actually talking about him as a hypocrite. Why? Because, because of his afraid of conflict, so he got involved with the Jews and Christians. And therefore, um, he took, the, he took shelter with them, he took protection with them. Uh, and so, so the problem, uh, and, and that was why the verse was revealed. Particularly Imam Al-Khurtubi, he said, this is specifically referring to Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul because of that attitude he exhibited. And therefore, uh, uh, on the basis of this verse, what the verse is saying is that as Muslims, you shouldn't take Jews and Christians as guardian, particularly on matters of religion, because they have their own interest. And this hypocritical relationship that is self-centered is the kind that is problematic, not actually general relationship that is open as uh, earlier mentioned by Ibrahim, Brother Ibrahim Bello. In other words, what we see is whether some look at it as a hypocrite Abu Lubaba or whether some look at it as Abdullah bin uh, Ubay bin Salun, one thing they all seem to recognize, and uh, bin Salul was known as a major hypocrite uh, during the time of the Prophet, they seem to all agree it's about hypocritical behavior. Um, and so contextually, that's what it's about. Uh, and I'd like to ask, starting with you, Malam Nasir, um, the warning in this verse, how is that relevant today for Muslims involved in interfaith engagement in dealing with people of other faiths? Well, I think uh, the warning is, number one, trying to caution Muslims, particularly regarding this hypocritical behavior in interfaith relations as Ali I mentioned and discussed with the case of Ibn Ubay Ibn Salul and Abu Lolo at al -Majusi. And the second issue is that uh, while you relate with them, they need to be cautious and careful so as not to compromise 
your belief, your religion, and what have you. But aside that, uh, or rather, this is not in any way negating or going against this uh, provisions or this encouragement for you to relate with them with respect, with kindness, with justice. Uh, it's not in any way against that. It's talking or warning, particularly on the issue of compromise, on the on the aspect of hypocritical relationship, as uh, the case as uh, based on the cases cited. what would you add here? Yeah, if one detaches that verse from context, what would you do with Quran chapter five, verse five, that permits marrying women, chaste mm. women from the Ahlul Kitab? What do you do with it? What do you do with Quran chapter 60 verses 9 and 10? That is like a general basis for peaceful coexistence and kindness to people of all faiths. Mm. As 60, long as they are not 8 and 9, as yeah. long as they are not hostile to you. Mm. So in essence, like he stated earlier, the verse is just telling you, do not take them as helpers, as guardians, in preference to and against fellow believers, mm. people of your own faith. No one does that actually except a monarchic, a hypocrite. But that's all. Aside that, the verse is not telling Muslims, it's not prohibiting peaceful coexistence, interpersonal relation, dialogue, cooperation to achieve a common goal, okay? Agreeing to live peacefully. And it was not even abrogated because history has it that the verses of peaceful coexistence, particularly in Surah al mumtahina chapter 60, was revealed far, far later. Mm. And so, you have to read this thing. If you detach some of these things in con with their, from the context, you have problem with interpreting the bigger uh, majority of verses of Quran. This is, this is, I think, very important. The need to not take verses in isolation, to forget their own context and how scholars explain these verses, what they referred to. The context of the whole Quran, because as you said, if there's no doubt the Quran has allowed Muslims to have treaties um, and be, you know, have these peace alliances uh, with people of other faiths. So it's not telling you you can't have allies in that sense. Um, Prophet and Sahaba were involved in battles side by side with people of other faiths, with Jews, like in uh, Uhud and some of these, fighting common enemy. So it's not that you cannot collaborate and be allies in that sense. Uh, Muslims sought protection of a Christian king in Habasha. So it's not that you can't seek protection uh, from a non-Muslim. Um, so if you are to just interpret the verse, you know, in isolation, as if it is talking about every kind of uh, wilaya, um, you would misinterpret it. But by looking at its own context, that this is about hypocrisy of people collaborating with people of other faiths, hypocritically against Muslims, then it's clear to see what the verse uh, is warning us against and why we should not allow alliances to make us undermine the values of our faith uh, uh, and the Muslim community or anything that is good actually, even if it's alliances to undermine other good people of other faiths. So this issue of not being hypocritical. Yes. Thank you very much and I know there are many examples inshallah over the next episodes we will be looking at other examples of alliances and other verses of the Quran inshallah that are sometimes misinterpreted. Jazakumullah khairan thank you very much until next time assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh